Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kent Scott. He has received his PhD from Charles Down University in Darwin. He has also a background, extensive background in plant ecology, also aware of environmental futures. We've had the privilege of having him work with our Academy for Future Science here in Australia, which brings together consciousness, uh, perspectives in all of the social sciences, all of the biological and planetary sciences in terms of a new model of regeneration for a positive future. So without further ado, if we could have full attention, if you could turn off your cell phones, if our cameras could be focused here to the front, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a dear colleague, Dr. Ken Scott. The theme of today's talk that I'll be talking about is um, a couple of different topics. I'm still carrying on with that policy theme, but on what would seem to be two quite different topics, and that's policy narratives and energy grids, or Earth energy grids. And I'm going to try and weave those two aspects into a story that lets us understand what I call complex natural and cultural resource management issues in sacred science. Now, I'm only a young person, so I can't stand up here and give you years of wisdom about what I've learnt uh, through this journey of life, um, you know, in a, in a conference called Shaping the Future. But what I can do is, is talk about some of the things that I've been involved in in, in my short working life uh, as an example of some of the ways that we can help shape the future. It weaves together, the story weaves together energy grids, policy narratives, sacred science and what we mean by sacred science and bringing that all together into a way that we can, we can all work together to, to create a better future for ourselves. So the first thing we need to really talk about is what exactly we mean by uh, energy grids and vortex points and, and really what the issue here is. The issue that I see is that we have, we have one planet and we have, uh, what is it, six billion people now all sharing the same space, the same planetary life space. So we've got these issues of land ownership and, and working together and how, how we manage different areas. Uh, you know, for example, particular areas that are shared by different groups of people. Different people have different ideas about how those places should be managed or how people should work together um, and, and, you know, how places are used and, and how we manage these places from a policy perspective, also from more of a cultural perspective as well, outside of the government policy spheres. It's, a, it's an issue that has interested me for a little while now. Um, Bradley and I have been lucky enough to travel to some of these places, uh, to some of these energy grids and, and these so-called vortex points to discover them. And what we've seen is some examples of, um, some really interesting examples of, of different cultures and different people. And we see here in that example of Sedona on the left-hand side, where it's a, it's, a, it's a real new age mecca where people come together and they, you know, they, they, they do yoga and they do lots of meditation. They, they travel to these, these vortex points, these special energy places on the Earth's surface um, to, to sort of feel that Earth energy. And, um, so I guess the first question we need to ask is what is an energy grid? What is a vortex point? Um, it's a good question. I guess you'd start off by saying Human beings have always tried to define where they are on the Earth. So even before the days of GPS, we needed to know where we were. So we might have used stars and constellations and things, but we devised a system of mapping the Earth into a grid of latitude lines and longitude lines so we could tell people where we are. It's an arbitrary system. Those lines could have been anywhere and numbered in any way. But what we find with ancient civilizations is they already had a map of knowing where they were. It wasn't particularly drawn in a cave or using lines, but they had a conceptual idea of where they were based on what we could call earth energy currents that run through the landscape. Uh, so people would travel through the land singing, if you like, these song lines, traveling through different areas uh, that were connected through energy currents, if you like. And we see that depicted in Aboriginal art uh, contemporary Aboriginal art, uh, particularly, but also some of these more ancient depictions here. Yeah, exactly of of the map of Australia and and how we see this interconnectedness 
of yeah. what we term earth and energy. Uh, th this was an exhibition in South Australia's museum just a few months ago. It's talking about a song line from the APY lands up in Central Australia. When we look at contemporary models, we first must mention in 1973 the Book of Knowledge, The Keys of Enoch, which mentioned uh, grids in that context. And it's mentioned in Key 105, but also in 108, which I'd like to mention and read out now. It says in verse 46, the point in the earth is the interlocking key to a vast immortal structural pattern operating between the heavens and the earth. This, this structure is not only composed of the icosahedron geometry connecting the earth grid points on the earth, but also the, includes the pentagon arrangements which form a dodecahedron geometry superimposed on a different energy level around the earth. So what we see is the ability to combine different geometric forms and overlay that onto the earth to give certain geometric structures. Um, contemporary grid workers, if you like, people like Beth Hagen's synthesized a number of different grids. Uh, she also used the icosahedron and the dodecahedron models. And I just wanted to mention also that uh, Brad, myself, Jess and Darren and Bianca were involved in an artistic project that tried to examine grids and, and how they interplay with ecology and so on. Just as some of the examples of the grids that we're talking about, this is, UV, or Beth Hagen talks about the universal vector grid model when she numbers the different points. So this is point 43 off Western Australia. Um, I'm not suggesting there is a relationship with MH370, except to say that it's in the same area. <laughs> we have to entertain the possibility of some sort of relationship there. Um, UVG 27 is up in the Gulf of Carpentaria. I hope you can see that okay. The, the point of showing you all these different grids is, is tying into the idea that people go to these grid points and actually and do things there. They go to visit, they go to uh, sing the, the names of God and so on. And you know, here we have an opportunity in our own backyard to travel to some of these grid points and, um, and to really work with the, the earth energies that are there. Uh, so this is our very own grid point in the Flinders Ranges in South Australia. And we see a lot of people travel to this grid point in particular to, to work with the energy that's there, to really, to really feel that vibration and to, to, to connect with the high heavens. And it's, it's a real mecca, but perhaps not a very well exploited uh, concept of this tourism involving earth energy grids. Uh, that's Bradley and I standing there at a, at a sign that uh, tells you there's a grid coming up, but somebody's written 44 to, uh, to know grid point 44. Uh, one of the myths about grid point 44 is that the actual grid point is in the middle of Wilpina Pound. It's about 50 kilometres from Wilpina Pound. If you look at some of the grid lines that come out of grid, this grid and across the whole grid network, you can follow one of them along near Melbourne here, that's Melbourne, uh, there's a faint line going across here. That is a, an old stone circle arrangement that's quite close to the grid line. And so what we see is a lot of these ancient sites connected to grid lines and grid points, and for particular energetic reasons too. Um, not just by the ancient people, but for the, for the modern context of why people might want to come to these places, they're tapping into that energy, that, the, the power point or energy source of the land. And so we see an ancient stone circle arrangement. It's probably hard to see on here, but it is there. And a couple of stones up here that reflect the mountains here. Great places to go for both non-Aboriginal people uh, and of course Aboriginal people who want to connect back into their, into their ancestors. Um, which kind of leads me on to talking about so going further afield. Uh, we have the opportunity as uh, sacred activists, if you like, or you know, world travellers to explore some of these grid points around the world and to really work with them um, in our own ways, in our own special ways. Uh, for Bradley and myself, it's going to these places 
of antiquity, such as in Angkor Wat, to uh, you know, meditate, to really reflect on the higher meaning of these places, and to really um, work with them on that high level. So to really take it as like a sacred journey. And we've had the pleasure and opportunity to travel throughout uh, many other grid points or uh, places on the earth with, with a very high level of significance to ancient cultures. This is a, a trilithon in Tonga, which uh, of course is in the middle of the Pacific and connected to the, to the ancient civilization of the moon. So that's one example. And then traveling to the Mayan pyramids in Central America in 2012 for the, the end of you know, the end of the Mayan calendar countdown. Um, I learned a lot about sacred site management there on that trip because what we saw was a whole list of things that you can and can't do, which is quite interesting because it's the first thing that you see when you get into these sites is, is really what you, what you can and can't do. Um, some things, yeah, of course, you probably wouldn't take your dog, but interestingly, they don't like people doing ceremonies. So if you're one of these people that like to you know, hold hands in a circle and, and maybe sing or you know, really rejoice in a, in a positive way, then they, they really frown upon that. And I learned this a few days ago when I was doing research for this topic, that uh, it looks like Paul McCartney wants to do a concert at Chichen Itza, and quite rightly, people didn't really like the idea of there being a rock concert at a you know, site of antiquity. Um, and of course, we see a bit of conflict from time to time where different people have different ideas about what they can do in sacred sites. We see that also in Australia where there are different, I guess, beliefs or belief structures between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people sharing that same space or that same resource. Um, and of course, within different cultures, there's diversity as well. So certain Aboriginal people might have a different idea about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate when it comes to working with energy grids and um, you know, doing certain ceremonies and things. And of course, there's all these issues about native title, land ownership, and, and what it means to have responsibility for an area, both formally and in, informally in that cultural context. Um, I don't want to mention this example too much, but it was a controversial cross-cultural event in South Australia for the last two years. And um, it's what really got me interested in the next part of my talk, which is uh, the policy narrative perspective. We've got all this conflict in areas where you know, there are different beliefs by different people, but we've got to try to come to an understanding of what's happening. And so the way that I was able to do that working with Beth Hagens is through this idea of using policy narratives. Policy narratives are where you have different beliefs within a certain situation, which creates that controversy, because two different groups are opposing each other. What we can do with policy narratives is talk about different narrative elements in that story, and also the characters that comprise that narrative. So I'm going to use a case study of a wind farm in Massachusetts, which uh, was quite controversial at the time. It's an example from a journal article that I thought was a great example. Uh, I've, got, I've got a question here, setting, that's the setting for this policy narrative. Is it a sacred site? Well, it depends on your point of view. Uh, for me personally, it's not a sacred site because I have no connection to that land. If I was to be living there, uh, especially if I was a Native American, yeah, it may well be a sacred site. So it all depends on your perspective. But anyway, that's the example that I want to give for how to resolve some of these issues in sacred sites. And it's to write the narrative. So I was working with Beth Hagens on, on these narratives, trying to understand some of the cross-cultural events happening in Australia. And it's, it's a really great way of making sense of all the different things that are happening in the media. Because what we see played out on, on Facebook and YouTube and the news is different people have different, um, you know, they, they have different cases to argue for and, and really a lot of emotion caught up in, in their arguments. So it's really hard to get a sense of, of who's actually coming out on top and, or who, is, who has the better point of view and so on. So what, what we can do is 
in this case study, look at, we can split the, the case study to look at, you know, who was for wind power. So there was this wind farm development being proposed off the, the coast of Massachusetts. And there were certain people for the idea and certain people against the idea. Um, it appears I'm running out of time, so I'll just run through this quite quickly. But there were two different advocacy coalitions, you could say. So that's what we get from our case study. Uh, people for and against the wind farm. You can split them by their differences in, in their policy beliefs. So those that were for the wind farm, um, sorry, yeah, in this case, what they're doing is portraying victims. Um, and you can use that to, to split, you know, who's for the wind farm and who's against the, the wind farm. So those who were for the wind farm were arguing that the environment were the victims in all of this, that we have global warming and that we need to, you know, create more renewable uh, energy sources and so on. Those that were against the wind farm were saying that there are human victims in all of this, that people will be paying more for electricity and so on. And you get all this by looking at what was in the media. So it's not really about, it's no intellectual discussion, it's really just about what, what you've seen there in the media. Um, and by looking at all of that information in the media, you can tell who's basically winning the argument and who's losing ground. And what we see is that you display different attitudes or different behaviours based on whether you perceive yourself as winning or losing. Uh, I don't like the necessarily the term winners and losers, but um, you see a difference in, um, in attitudes. I guess. If, you, if you look at the winners there, what they tend to do is construct a story that, that keeps their ground, keeps the status quo. Whereas those um, who consider themselves losing seek that policy change. So I won't go into this in too much detail, but you can see that there's a, there's a, a format of working out you know, who believes in what and, and who's actually on what side of the coin. Uh, in this particular case, those that were for the wind farm could be categorised as winners because they actually they, they won their case and the wind farm was built. Um, but what we find is that they concentrate the costs on a very small number of people and they diffuse the benefits to a large number of people. Um, in this case, you know, lots of people will be given employment and they'll be leading the way in energy efficiency. When we look at the other, the anti-wind farm group, uh, they diffuse the cost, so they narrow the costs of wind farm um, uh, to the victims. Uh, sorry, they, they broaden the cost, saying that the cost of this wind farm was across lots of different people, lots of different areas, and the benefits were on a very few number of individuals. I mentioned I didn't really like the term winners and losers, but I think if we were to go forward with managing our sacred sites and our places, we wouldn't necessarily have winners and losers, we would all be working together. <laughs>